all the latest live from Ukraine this lunchtime, also on the programme. Comedian Chris Rock talks about that slap for the first time. The end of free COVID tests in England. I'm joined live by Dr. Sarah Jarvis. We'll have her advice on how we learn to live with the virus. And World Cup final, here they come. England's women cricketers with another stunning performance. TV Lunchtime News with Romilly Winks. Good afternoon. Demoralised, short of equipment and refusing to carry out orders. That's the verdict of British intelligence on Russian forces in Ukraine. In a rare public appearance, the head of GCHQ has said that President Putin overestimated the abilities of his military to secure a rapid victory. Sir Jeremy Fleming suggested that Russian generals are afraid to tell the Putin the truth about the situation on the ground. It comes as the Kremlin once again promised a temporary ceasefire around Mariupol. A convoy of buses is on its way to the besieged city in the hope that some of the 150,000 civilians enduring terrible conditions and near constant shelling might finally be evacuated. In a moment, we'll be live in western Ukraine with our correspondent Geraint Vincent. First, Martin Stew has our report. Staring down the barrel, Mariupol continues to feel the full force of Russian aggression. 170,000 people are still stranded inside the besieged city. Water and supplies are running out. The bombardment has left thousands dead and residential areas in ruins. Satellite images showing before and after artillery attacks. But despite the destruction, Putin's push for victory appears to have stalled. In a rare public appearance, the UK spy chief has said the Kremlin has badly misjudged the situation in Ukraine. We've seen Russian soldiers, short of weapons and morale, refusing to carry out orders, sabotaging their own equipment, and even accidentally shooting down their own aircraft. And even though we believe Putin's advisers are afraid to tell him the truth, what's going on and the extent of these misjudgments must be crystal clear to the regime. Last night, a major gas pipeline in Kharkiv was hit, as was a farm on the outskirts. President Zelensky has asked the Australian government for more help to fight back. The fate of the global security is decided now. Thank you. Thank you, Australia. Slava Ukraini. Back in Mariupol, Today, there is a glimmer of hope. Russians telling the Red Cross they'll open a humanitarian corridor. Ukraine's deputy prime minister has confirmed 45 buses are now on their way to deliver aid and remove the most vulnerable. Zelensky believes Putin is planning to scale up the war in the east. If attack helicopters like these filmed by the Russian military are en route, it's more vital than ever and the Mariupol evacuation is successful this time. Martin Stew, ITV News. And we can go to Garrett Vincent, who's in Lviv. Garrett, you've been to a briefing this morning with the Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister. What did she have to say about these comments that President Putin is not being informed about the situation on the ground? Well, she said it was possible, but it, it was difficult for her to know what exactly the Russian president is being told. Whatever, though, uh, she said, she said what's being done to Ukraine is on the conscience of the Russian military's high command. And she also said that Putin alone was not responsible for the Russian aggression and that in this online world, she could not accept that the Russian people do not understand or do not see the suffering of Ukraine. Uh, she made another accusation. She said that those 45 buses that Martin was just uh, telling us about, uh, the, the buses that her government had sent to get people out of Mariupol, were on their way to the city along that humanitarian corridor. But she said they were being held up at a checkpoint because Russian forces were not letting them through. What that city really needs, of course, is a ceasefire. And I think that Vladimir Putin has shown that he has a clear grasp, at least, of what his military is doing there. 
because he said that the bombardment of Mariupol will not stop until its defenders uh, surrender. And in a call with the Italian Prime Minister this morning, the Russian president has been reported as saying that the conditions are not yet in place for a ceasefire. OK, go right. Thank you for that update. And the British government has hit several Russian media firms and individuals with sanctions, as well as a Russian colonel accused of shelling civilians in that city, Mariupol. General Mikhail Mzintsev has been referred to as the butcher of Mariupol and is accused of ordering the bombing of a children's hospital, as well as a theatre where people, including children, were sheltering. In other news, comedian Chris Rock has broken his silence after he was slapped at the Oscars. He told an audience at his first gig following the shocking assault that he's still processing what happened. Oscar winner Will Smith was asked to leave the awards show but refused, the Academy has revealed. Here's Rishi Davda. Heading back to the stage after being slapped in front of the world. Chris Rock was ready to tell jokes but not ready to talk about the one that angered an A-lister. How was your weekend? I'm still kind of processing okay. what happened at some point. I'm talking about this <laughs> And, you know, it'll be serious, it'll be funny. Fans showed their love right from the start. The best part is the beginning when he came out, we gave him a standing ovation, a warm welcome, three times, and he cried. And he was phenomenal, awesome, and, um, yeah, he just, he came out and he said, I'm still processing, like, kind of what happened, but let's go on with the show. <laughs> oh, wow! Will Smith wow. slapped Chris after he joked about wife Jada's shaved head, a result of the hair loss condition alopecia. He was asked to leave, said no, and then picked up the award for best actor. Oscars organizers said Mr. Smith was asked to leave the ceremony and refused. We recognized that we could have handled the situation differently. One person who wished they had was Oscar's co-host Wanda Sykes. It was sickening. It was absolutely... I physically felt ill, and I'm still a little traumatized Me by too. it. Me too. Me um, too. And for them to let him stay in that room and enjoy the rest of the show and accept his award, I was like, how gross is this? <laughs> Post slap, Smith partied the night away, Oscar in hand. The Academy has now started disciplinary proceedings against the actor. But the police won't be getting involved after Rock decided not to press charges. Rishi Davda, ITV News. The police believe lockdown laws were broken at Downing Street parties, a second cabinet minister has said. But it's still something the prime minister has so far refused to admit. Well, our political correspondent Carl Dinan is in Downing Street for us. Carl, the first 20 fines are on their way, but Boris Johnson still won't say that the law has been broken. It's a very funny situation, isn't it, where two senior ministers, Justice Secretary Dominic Raab and Trade Secretary Anne-Marie Trevelyan, have both said the police believe uh, wrongdoing has been committed, but the Prime Minister won't admit it himself. This was how Anne-Marie Trevelyan uh, put it this morning. Uh, as the Justice Secretary uh, set out yesterday, uh, the breaches of COVID regulations uh, are being uh, dealt with by the Metropolitan Police and they are setting out fines where they believe those breaches occurred. Now contrast that with what the Prime Minister said yesterday when MPs asked him if the fine showed that rules have been broken. He just dodged the question. I, I've been, I, I hope, uh, very frank with the House about uh, where I think we've, we've gone wrong and uh, the things that I, I regret that I, I apologise for. But that I've, I've been very clear, I won't um, give running commentary on an on <laughs> ongoing investigation. Uh, in a very strict sense, it is right to say that wrongdoing hasn't actually been proved by the issuing of a fine until that fine has been accepted or else it's been challenged and it's gone through a court process. But officially, what Number 10 say is the reason for the Prime Minister's reluctance to talk about this is because he is a subject still of this investigation. We still don't know if he has been issued with a fine or not, although they've told us they will tell us if he is. But there is also a suspicion around Westminster that the Prime Minister doesn't want to admit that these fines show any kind of wrongdoing because as soon as he does, he will be under huge pressure to go to Parliament and explain to them why he said that no rules had been broken. 
Carl, thank you very much for that. Still to come, the end of COVID tests in England and England's women cricketers through to the World Cup final. First, many people take CBD oil or tablets because of the supposed health benefits like easing symptoms of anxiety or help with falling asleep. And from today, the Food Standards Agency is trying to crack down on which products can be sold. Well, I'm joined now by Mary Biles, who's written a book on CBD. Mary, what do you make of the FSA's stance? I think they, they've kind of got them into a bit of a, um, they've made a rod for their own back, really, I think is, is what's happened because um, the CBD market has been going now for several years and um, I think there are over a million people regularly use CBD um, and it kind of became this, this huge trend that everybody was using it. It was going in things like hummus, it has been applied to pillows as well as the kind of the CBD capsules and, and oils that a lot of people are used to taking. Um, and, and what happened was it actually started in Europe. The European Food Safety Authority added CBD to the novel food catalogue. Um, and a novel food is something that wasn't commonly uh, consumed before 1997. And then in order to sell products that can contain novel food, they have to have um, an authorization and which essentially proves their, their safety and that they're not toxic. So that's kind of what's been happening with CBD. It was deemed to be a novel food. Um, and then kind of retrospectively, um, companies have had to prove that their products are safe. And would you accept that a great deal more research needs to be done on the benefits and potential harms of CBD? Um, CBD comes from hemp and hemp has been used safely um, as a foodstuff and in medicine for thousands of years. If we're talking so you don't want to be spending, you know, 30 pounds on a on a 10 mil bottle and it contains a tiny amount of CBD. So that is one good thing that, that comes from this regulation, because, you know, it is true. It was a little bit yeah. of the wild west previously. Yeah. Um, Mary, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Thank you very much for talking to us. My pleasure. The Labour leader hit out at the government today over what he described as its pathetic response to the cost of living crisis. Sakir Starmer was at the launch of his party's local election campaign and the focus was on the hardship many are facing. Our North of England reporter Sangeeta Lal is in Berry. Sangeeta, are Labour seeing these elections as a referendum on the cost of living crisis? Labour are essentially seeing this as a cost of living election, focusing on the high price of bills, but also on tax burdens. The Labour leader spoke today only for a few minutes, but was very critical of the government, accusing them of, as you say, having a pathetic response to high prices in bills and urging voters to send the government a message they can't ignore. Now, Sir Keir Starmer hopes to win voters over by reducing energy bills, by introducing a windfall levy and excess profits of oil and gas companies, which he suggests could cut energy bills by about £600. Now, it's also interesting that Labour chose Bury as a place to launch their campaign. Labour have recently gained an MP from the Conservatives who defected in this area, and they're hoping their message on the cost of living will also prove popular with voters at a local level too. We're fighting for every vote every seat that we can possibly get across the United Kingdom. we have battling hard. We've got five weeks to send that message. Um, and my job is to earn every vote uh, and to put in the very best result that we can. Now, it's worth remembering that the May elections will be the first party test since the war in Ukraine, the cost of living crisis and rows over parties in Downing Street. Now, voters will go to the polls in England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland in five weeks' time. After they've heard from all parties, the question is whether Labour will be able to cut through. Sangeeta, thank you for that. Tomorrow sees the end of free COVID testing for most people in England. High demand for lateral flows ahead of the deadline have meant many have already been struggling to get them. In England, free tests will only be available for patient-facing NHS staff and for care home staff and their residents. They'll also be available for the over-75s and over-12s with weakened immune systems.
In Scotland, free lateral flow testing will end on the 18th of April. Free PCR tests will be available until the 30th. In Wales, free tests are available to everyone until the end of June. And in Northern Ireland, there's a review taking place. Well, I'm joined by our regular Lunchtime News GP, Dr Sarah Jarvis, who's guided us through the pandemic, and by the UK Health Security Agency Chief Executive, Dr Dame Jenny Harris. Well, Dr Harris, if we could start with you. Do you think this really is the right time to be ending free testing when COVID rates in the community are still so high? Well, you're, you are right, of course. The ONS report uh, last week up to the 25th of March showed that there were around three, three and a half million cases of COVID across the UK. But of course, that is not translating now into uh, significant hospitalizations or deaths. Um, and that's because we now have really good vaccination programs. Uh, we're protecting our most vulnerable and we have treatments in the form of antivirals or monoclonal antibodies uh, for those who are most vulnerable. And so I think what we, we're doing is exactly what the programme says, is learning to live with COVID and treating it much more like a more normal winter respiratory virus or a respiratory virus and moving the responsibilities back to individuals, but giving those who most need protection that extra support to do to be protected. And we've got the highest um, hospital admissions since February, Dr Harris, since February last year, and staff absences in the NHS due to COVID are going up. How concerned are you about those two factors? So we've always, uh, in the UK, tried to protect our health services, not just because of COVID, but it's important that we maintain good services for other conditions as well. Obviously, uh, people can suffer with those and we need to keep them flowing through our systems. So we always do take particular notice of hospital admissions um, and, uh, and keep an eye on the epidemiology right across the country. Um, the, the fact that we do have those high admissions is of concern. It's particular concern in some areas. So the southwest, I might draw out, where we've had high rates of infection and uh, hospitals tend to uh, get fairly full. But there is a, a general agreement, I think, that the infections are starting to level out a little bit. In Scotland, we've seen a very, very sharp rise, and that's now starting to decline. Um, and whilst we will continue to watch that carefully, uh, I'm optimistic that we will be moving into a, a, a downward or at least more plateaued phase that is manageable of this particular surge. Let's hope so. And Sarah, I, I want to talk to you about what everybody's wondering, which is what is the responsible thing to do now? Uh, say you have cold symptoms. Uh, should you still be testing? Should you just say, I'm, I'm not going to go to work, I'm not going to see people? So the problem we've got is that if you've got cold symptoms and you can't access NH test testing and can't afford a private one, you're not going to know whether or not you've got COVID. School advice has now changed and they're now recommending that children who have a fever should be kept off school until the fever is gone and they're well enough to go back. Now, most parents will keep their kids off if they have a fever, but I do have some concerns this is still going to lead to spread. And frankly, come September, when kids go back to school and there are just just coughs and colds everywhere, that could be a real issue. The recommendation is that if you have got respiratory symptoms, in other words, cough, fever, loss of or change to your sense of smell or taste, although that's less common with Omicron, then you should be staying and self-isolating for five days, even if you can't get access to a lateral flow test. Now, I do understand that's going to be difficult because a lot of people who've got colds that aren't COVID will be worrying about their livelihood if they have to take five days off and they don't know if it's COVID or not. Yeah, very difficult. Dr. Sarah Jarvis and Dr. Jenny Harris, thanks for setting all of that out for us so clearly. And finally, there was another incredible performance by England's women's cricket team, who've beaten South Africa by 137 runs and made it to the World Cup final. Warren Nettleford watched the action. Take them off. Yes, that's a clean stomping. The moment a dream was realised. They've done it. The England cricket team reaching another World Cup final. To get there, they had to dispatch a South African team who'd already beaten them in the group stages. This time, though, it was different. Danny Wyatt set the scene for England with a brilliant 129 runs. And for the target for South Africa was 294. Maybe that's why England were laughing. Would the South Africans rue dropping her five times? 
Well, yes. Get off, Masabata Klausman. When they came to bat, the wickets kept falling. She is too good a bowler. Helps if you have the world's best bowler in your team. Just one of six wickets for Sophie Eccleston. It was just a matter of time before the emotions and celebrations were unleashed. So, one more match to see if they can retain the World Cup. It's Australia in the final. Maybe you've heard of them. Warren Nettleford, ITV News. Amazing performance. And that is it this lunchtime. Mary's here with the evening news at 6.30. The news where you are follows the national weather. But from everyone here, goodbye.